What we're going to talk about over the next hour is one of the most important issues, I think, facing our government. We've sat here today and listened to a lot of very valid pleas, really, for help from the federal government. And the reality is, we don't have the money. There are four words that I have not heard in the United States Senate or Congress, actually, since I've been here over the last year and a half. And that is, we cannot afford it. The problem is, is right now we have a budget crisis. We have a debt crisis. Now, let me say this. Fixing the budget process will not solve the debt crisis. Let's be very clear about that. But we will not solve the debt crisis unless and until we address the dysfunction in our budget process. The problem is that in the last 42 years, since 1974, the Budget Act of 1974, the budget process here has only worked four times. This is a chart, Mr. President, that charts this out. The yellow lines here, and I hope the people at home can see, I hope my colleagues can focus on this, only four times in the last 42 years has this budget process that was enacted in 1974 actually functioned at all to fund the federal government. Now, one of the major responsibilities of our jobs here in the Senate and in the House is to fund the federal government, to take care of discretionary needs like we've heard today from Flint, from Louisiana, from West Virginia, from Maryland. These are valid needs. But Mr. President, every dime that we spend in our discretionary spending is borrowed. And I'll talk about that a little later. We've got some speakers today uh, that uh, are going to talk about the results of not having a budget process that works. And this chart explains that over the last 42 years, since 1974, four times have 13 bills, appropriation bills, actually been passed, and we funded the government the way we're supposed to. Now, the blue lines are the actual appropriation bills. Now, since 1998, somewhere in there, we went from 13 bills to 12 bills that actually fund. These are appropriation bills that fund the federal government. And they fund $1.1 trillion of a $3.9 trillion spend of the federal government. And this chart shows that over the life of this law, these are the laws, the appropriation bills that have been passed each year. And the average is the red line. It's very light. You probably can't see it. But the average over this period of time is 2.6 of the 12 or 13 bills that have to be passed to, to fund the government. 2.6. And of the last 19 consecutive years, Mr. President, We've used 107 continuing resolutions to get past the fiscal year to make sure we fund the government on the first day of the new fiscal year. Now, next Monday, this is how serious this is. Next Monday is the first day of the next fiscal year, FY17. And we sitting here today are voting on the CR, the continuing resolution, to get us past this day so the government doesn't have to shut down next week. Those dreaded words of irresponsibility and intransigence. And quite frankly, this is part of the problem because what happens is what happened last year. The dysfunction in the system is centered around this. The budget is not a law. It's a resolution. That means that the majority with 51% of the votes in this body can pass its political statement. And that's exactly what happened last year. And let me say this, Mr. President, before we go any further. Everything you hear today is nonpartisan. This, this should be about a nonpartisan exercise that we have in funding the government. Yes, we're going to have debates based on our partisanship and based on what we, our beliefs and principles are. But the basic process should be a politically neutral platform that allows us to argue our differences out in the budget process, get to a budget, move to the appropriations, and fund the government by the end of the fiscal year. And we have only done that four times in the last 42 years. The dysfunction is centered around this. If you look at, at this chart, every year, we just don't have enough time, basically. It's not just time, but it's the process. If the budget is based on, a, it's a resolution, and 51% can vote it forward. Last year, as an example, the majority, the Republican majority, by the way, voted a political bill that took $7.5 trillion out of the president's budget over the next 10 years without one Democratic vote. Then we got to the authorization process, and the authorization process, oh, by the way, is a law, and they have to have 60 votes. So guess what? The people on the other side of the aisle, my friends, have, have stood up and said, well, you didn't ask our opinion in the budget process. Why do you want our help now? And so they don't let us get on the appropriations. And we've got some $310 billion that we're funding today that are not authorized. Over 256 
agencies and programs. The next thing is we go to the appropriation. Again, the minority party can stop the process by not letting us get on the bills. We have a situation right now, and this is nonpartisan, but it's a reality, that the defense authorization, the defense appropriation bill, which funds our military, was passed unanimously in committee. The way it was supposed to operate, Democrats, Republicans got together, worked it out, made amendments, and came up with a bill that funded our federal government's military. And yet, we tried six times to get it to the floor. And there are political reasons why it hasn't gotten to the floor, but it shows the dysfunction that we have in this process. Mr. President, the time has come for us to address this process. And I'm so excited to have various members of the freshman class. We have the chairman of the budget committee coming down. We have uh, some other senior members who have been working on this for years. But I noticed my, my good friend from the state of North Carolina, Senator T uh, Tom Tillis is here. And I'm gonna ask him to give us his perspective. They are, have a big military uh, uh, effort in their state. And Tom has been a soldier in this, not only in, in the Senate, but in his time as Speaker of the House in North Carolina. Mr. President. Senator from North Carolina. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I wanna thank my colleague and friend from the great state of Georgia and uh, taking a leadership position and really pointing to the dysfunction, the problems that's going on here. Uh, now, uh, Senator Perdue is, uh, I guess you're, you're actually a two-year-old politician, aren't you? <laughs> I shouldn't be talking to him. I'm sorry, Mr. President. Mr. President or Senator Perdue is about two years old. He spent all of his time in business. He spent time in business where you didn't keep your job if you couldn't balance your budget. You didn't keep your job if you couldn't make the difficult decisions every year to year, make payroll, make strategic investments, do the kinds of things that good business leaders do. That's all he's done all of his life. And now he's found himself in the U.S. Senate where that's almost the exact opposite of what we do. We've just had to pass a continuing resolution today for a few weeks because we can't come to terms on long-term spending measures. Over a dozen bills passed out of appropriations with strong bipartisan support within the constraints of the bipartisan budget, and now we can't get them passed. Why is that a problem? Because when you have the, lar the world's largest and most complex entity that's ever existed that can't figure out how much money it's gonna spend or commit on more than about a 12-month cycle and sometimes only a few months, how on earth can you save money and let make long-term investments? How on earth? We were in a committee hearing yesterday where we heard right now it takes an average of 15 years from the concept of a new satellite to the time that we're launching it in space. Well, how on earth can you make those long-term investments when you can't even be clear that you're going to spend the money but every 12 months? This is a threat to our national security. This is a threat to our economic security. Uh, this is a threat to the security of every man and woman in the United States because they can't rely on a government that will provide businesses or individuals with any kind of certainty whatsoever. It's tough to make budget decisions, but they need to be made. I know a little bit about this because I became a Speaker of the House in North Carolina in 2011. We had a budget crisis. We had a $2.5 billion debt and six months to solve it. And unlike the federal government, where you can run up a deficit, you can run up a deficit every year, run up a debt that's now almost $20 trillion, most states, with the exception of maybe one or two, have a constitutional obligation to balance their budget. So we did. And what was the result of providing that long-term certainty? Living within our means, actually having a transparent and decisive budget process. One of the greatest economic turnarounds of any state in the nation over the last five years. Being decisive, uh, making the tough decisions accrues a benefit to the business, to business community, it accrues a benefit to every man and woman who lives in the United States, and actually it settles the global economic conditions more than mo what most people will know. At the end of the day, let's start doing our job. Let's not just create a budget like we did, a bipartisan budget, set it on the shelf, then pass several appropriations bills and kill them on the floor. That's what's going on here, and I think my freshman colleagues think that it's time. There's a lot of people who want to put posters up here, do your job. But they're failing to do their jobs by preventing us from doing one of the most important things that we can do. Make the tough, long-term fiscal decisions that are necessary for this great nation. So Senator 
Purdue, thank you for allowing me to speak on this. Or Mr. President, I think Senator Purdue, we have a conversation here. I shouldn't be conversing on the floor. But I want to thank Senator Purdue for bringing up this very important subject. We need to stay in front of this and recognize doing our job is tackling this budget crisis, tackling the uncertainty that we, by failing to do our jobs, are placing on every hardworking American and business in this country. And with that, Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President, um, uh, Senator Tillis, I thank you for uh, coming down and, and talking about this. You know, with your experience at state government in North Carolina, you know that 44 states have a balanced budget law. Guess what states don't have a financial situation, uh, financial problem? Thank you for coming down. Uh, and I note that uh, our, my colleague from uh, Oklahoma, Senator Lankford, is here. Uh, he's been a, a warrior on this budget when he, he was in the House before and now in the Senate for the last two years. And uh, I welcome his comments uh, to speak about this as well. Senator Lankford. Mr. President. Senator from Oklahoma. Mr. President, th this is a long-term issue. This is not something new. I'm, I'm amazed at the number of times that I run into people in Oklahoma and say, why can't we seem to get the budget done now? What's happened? And I've said, Let, let's back up for just a second. Since 1974, we've done a budget and done it correctly four times total. The Budget Act was created in 1974 right after Watergate to try to create this more transparent process. What they created was a process so incredibly difficult to work that it's worked four times since 1974. We've only had two years since 1974 that we haven't had a single CR. That's a continuing resolution. This body just passed another continuing resolution, meaning the appropriations process won't be done on time again this year, and that was settled today. The issues that we face with budgeting is not new. It's been 20 years since we've had no CR at all. This constant issue of putting the big budget issues off and trying to figure out how we're gonna navigate through the Senate procedures and get the budget done has to stop. And at some point, we have to have a determination to say, we can't just keep saying, next year this will improve. Next year this will improve. We're not gonna get a better product until we get a better process. And we have a very bad process right now, and we need to admit it's a bad process. What I'm proud of is that there are multiple members of this body, from the leadership of the Budget Committee through freshmen that are here, brand new senators, that are all focused on the same thing. Let's solve how we do budgeting and to actually get to a better product by improving the process. Now, what do we have? Almost $20 trillion in debt, and everyone argues about what we're gonna do on a few things to try to do management, but no one's really talking about how do we actually get us back to balance and paying off the debt. It's a common conversation that I have with people in Oklahoma. This conversation with people that say, can we ever get this resolved? Is it too late? Americans believe on the whole, nothing will get better in Washington, D.C. dealing with the budget. And their question is, when and how does it get better? I wish I could give them a lot of hope on that. What I typically tell people, Mr. President, is that let's just do a for instance. Right now, let's say the budget, the balanced budget piece that we had, if we took the balanced budget piece that we put out earlier this year and actually took 10 years, chipped away at the deficit, and in 10 years chipped away at it and got back to a balance where we had no deficit that year, it was balanced. Then let's say the next year, we actually had a $50 billion surplus. It'd be a pretty good surplus. So we chip away in 10 years, get to balance, the next year we have a $50 billion surplus. Mr. President, do you know how long it would take us to pay off our debt if we had a $50 billion surplus? If we had a $50 billion surplus every year for 460 years in a row, we would pay off our debt. 460 years in a row of $50 billion surpluses and we can get on top of this. Everyone says that's unreasonable. And I would say it's certainly unreasonable if we don't change the way we do process. It just continues to get worse. There are some basic things we can do. We can do budgeting every two years. And people may say, well, how does that solve anything? That allows predictability and planning. It creates greater oversight. Right now, we, we do this every single year. And then the speed of what has to be done, how it has to be done, there's very little oversight on our spending. 
we can actually put all of the areas we have in spending all accountable every year. Right now, there's about 25% or so, 25 to 30% of our budget that we actually focus in on every year with the appropriations process. The rest of it's on autopilot, and it's never touched until we get everything in front of everybody every year to be able to look at it for oversight, we're not gonna solve the big issues. We've gotta deal with what's called budget gimmicks. I've been at war with a budget gimmick called the chimp. It's my favorite of the gimmicks, there are a lot of them out there. Changes in mandatory programs, chimps. The changes in mandatory programs is a budget gimmick that's out there that says, we were planning to spend this much when we really weren't, but on paper it said we were. And then instead we said, no, we're not gonna spend that much this year, so we'll spend it on something else. But guess what? The next year they come back to the exact same dollars again and say, no, we're planning this year to do it, but we're really not, and so we'll spend it on something else. And it just adds debt every year. And we'll have billions of dollars in chimps built into our budget and claim that the deficit is even lower than it is. It's not. It's just this budget gimmick. And in real dollars, it makes it even bigger. We've got to deal with those budget gimmicks in there and to be able to take that away so that when the appropriations process is done, you get real numbers. The hardest thing to get in DC is the real number. So you've got to deal with all these gimmicks that are out there to remove those. You get with a longer time period to be able to plan, create some certainty. But one of the key things that we have to have is an actual deadline. This town doesn't function on anything other than deadlines and pressure points. And when it's time that it has to be resolved, we actually get it resolved. But if we don't have to resolve it right now, this town just says, tomorrow, we'll get it done next week. We'll get it done next session. So the focus is, how do we actually create those pressure points? So how about a simple idea? A simple idea that says, if we don't get the budget done on time, the appropriations bills done on time, then it goes to an automatic CR so we don't have a government shutdown because government shutdowns just waste money on the whole. So it automatically kicks in to last year's budget amount, but here's what changes. All of the members of Congress, our budget, our staff for how we function, our operating expenses, all of our committees, and the executive office of the White House. That's the three groups, both the House, the Senate, and the White House. All of our budgets drop immediately, let's say four, five, six percent the first day, and that does that for 30 days. And then if you still don't have the appropriations process, it cuts again, another big percentage. It puts the pressure where the pressure needs to be. It's not the fault of the agencies or the American people, the job wasn't done. It lies squarely in the House, the Senate, and the White House, and our negotiations not getting it done on time. It's a simple mechanism to say, if the task has not been done, put the pressure where the pressure needs to be. The cuts in the House, in the Senate, and on the White House, and push all of us to the table and get it resolved. The goal is to do appropriations in a transparent process so the American people can see how their money is being spent and to be able to do it wisely and to be able to create a process where you can actually solve the problem. Currently, we don't have a process that solves the problem. Now, this magically doesn't balance our budget. It still takes hard decisions, but at least creates a format where we could solve the problem. Right now, we don't even have that. So step one, like an AA group, let's at least admit there's a problem. There is a problem. Step two, let's get to work on fixing it and actually resolve the process, and then let's actually get to work balancing us and paying off our debt. Mr. President, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about this. Thank you very much, Senator um, I think my colleagues can see the passion and the history that he has had here, a lot of great thought. I note that the, the uh, chairman of our uh, budget committee in the Senate is here, Senator uh, Mike Enzi from Wyoming, and I'm going to turn it over to him to, uh, and ask him to give us his comments. He's been fighting this for years as chairman of the budget committee last year. He managed to get a budget out of our committee that actually took seven trillion, over $7 trillion out of the president's budget at that point in time. So, Senator Enzi, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank, thank you. Thanks for your comments. Uh, I don't get invited many places to speak because I talk about what you've been talking about and it depresses people. But it's about time that we got depressed over the budget and got some changes. And I appreciate everybody on the committee and those who are not on the committee who have been working to solve this problem. I know that most of you ran on 
getting a balanced budget, getting to a balanced budget, balancing it now if we could. Um, I get real frustrated because I, I know that we're $20 trillion in debt and headed to $29 trillion, and then, then I hear people say, yes, but we cut the deficit in half. That's not the debt. I don't like the word deficit. I call it overspending. That's what we're doing. And we just got the report that we're going to be $590 billion overspent this year. And uh, as Senator Lankford pointed out, 70% of the budget's on autopilot. So that 30% that we get to make a decision on, that's $1,070 billion. Now, we've got to worry a little bit because interest rates might go up. At $20 trillion, if it's 1%, that's $200 billion a year that we're throwing in a, in a rat hole. But uh, if that goes to 5%, which is the norm for the federal government, we're now at $1,000 billion a year in interest. Let's see, we get to make decisions on $1,070 billion, and $1,000 billion of that would go to interest. We better solve this pretty quick. We could be at 5%, I think, within three years. And uh, I, th I think that defense is over $500 billion, and that's not enough. So um, we, we definitely have a problem. As has been pointed out by the chart, um, tw in 40 years since the Budget Act was passed, we've only completed all 13 bills four times. Um, we've been holding hearings in the Budget Committee, and this group of people have been holding other meetings to see how it's done in the private sector, how it's done by other countries, how it's done by the states. And nobody does it like the federal government. Um, when I was trying to figure out the, the first budgets, I found out that the format that we use is not the same as the one that the Appropriations Committee uses, and definitely not the same format that the President uses. And then I found out that that's intentional. That's so you can't follow the dollars. But there are a lot of problems besides that in following the dollars. For instance, uh, we have 120 housing programs, and they're administered by 20 different agencies. Now, that's not seven per agency or one having more than the others. That means that the 120 programs are administered by all 20 of the agencies. Nobody's in charge. There's no goal set. We don't know if they completed what they, wanted, what they set out to do, and no way to make a correction if they did. And I pointed out a lot of times how far behind we are on actually uh, approving the things that we do. We don't ever go back and look at the old stuff. We're paying for a program from 1983 that has expired. Another one from 1987. A whole bunch of them from before 2006. So we've got to get off this autopilot and get to a new format. And I want to congratulate this group and uh, particularly Senator Perdue. Um, I remember introducing him the first time that uh, we had a budget committee meeting, and I said, Senator Perdue knows how to balance a budget. He's been working in the private sector. And he said, no, in the private sector, you have to show a little bit of a profit. <laughs> well, we're going to have to show a little bit of a profit around here if we're ever going to get rid of the debt. And we better do that, or our kids are really going to suffer. In fact, uh, in the private sector, we're having some pension problems. But we've been making the private sector put money away for the pensions, invest the money so that they'd be able to meet the promise that they made. The federal government doesn't do that. We just take it out of this budget. Now, if we spend $1,000 billion on interest and there's only $1,070 billion, what do you think is going to happen to federal employees who are expecting retirement? That could be in worse shape than the multi-employer plans. So we're going to have to come up with some solutions, and I appreciate this approach where we're looking at what the private sector does, what the states do, and what other countries do, and they have had success. Now, it's a little difficult because it causes some reorganization of what we're doing. Uh, you know, maybe we can wind up with one or five housing programs, and they'd all be under one agency so we could have goals. Um, we're going to have to have a portfolio method of budgeting so that we know what we're trying to do and whether we get it done. There are already some laws on the books that say that we do that, but we don't. So I congratulate you for doing this, and I'm, I'm so pleased that we have Senator Perdue heading up this effort because I mentioned he has saved some businesses before. 
And uh, they took his advice and reorganized. And uh, I think that a lot of us have looked at this and said, it could be done. It's going to be difficult because we don't, we don't even go back and look at old programs, let alone reorganize. So I hope people will pay attention to this, see if they have some other ideas to throw in. But listen carefully to what's being said here today, because this has to be fixed. And it has to be, I was hoping we could fix it before the elections, because we were getting cooperation from the other side of the aisle and uh, a lot of good suggestions. And uh, one of the reasons we were able to participate in a very bipartisan way, I think, is because none of us knew who the majority was going to be in the Senate, nor did we know who the president was going to be. And I think that made all of us a lot more reasonable. I hope after the elections we can still be reasonable and do something that will save this country. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I thank you for your comments, but more importantly, thank you for your heart in terms of running the Budget Committee and, and leading us into this uh, observation and recognition that, you know, as this chart says, we have a dysfunctional system. And I think we, we, uh, we don't have an alternative but to find a better plan. And with that, I note that uh, my good friend and esteemed colleague from Tennessee, Senator Corker, is here. He's chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. But more importantly, uh, he lets me sit next to him on the Budget Committee. And I will say this about the Foreign Relations Committee. It is a very bipartisan committee. And under Bill Clinton, just 16 years ago, we spent about $20, trillion, $20 billion running State Department and USAID. And currently, we're spending about $54 billion. That's just one department. Those are constant dollars to show you how government has sort of exploded in the last 15 years, both under Republican leadership and under Democratic leadership. Uh, and I am so glad that uh, Senator Corker is here. Uh, Senator Corker, I look forward to your comments. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I thank you for your leadership on this issue. And I want to start by uh, thanking Chairman Enzi also for the way he conducts uh, committee business, as you just mentioned, with uh, on a committee where basically the way that it's set up uh, binds both his arms and his legs behind his back, meaning that just the processes that we have in place make it impossible for us to really deal with our country's fiscal issues. So with you joining the committee, uh, having been a person who's dealt with business throughout the world, quickly seeing these frailties that uh, Chairman Enzi has to deal with, you've thrown yourself into trying to deal with those issues. And uh, I admire you for it. I think you and I both know that this is gonna take a while uh, because in essence, we're talking about a total reordering. We really don't have a budget process. I mean, to even call what we do a budget uh, per most human beings understanding of what a budget is, is obviously not realistic. So I thank you for that. Um, I'm an advocate of what Senator Perdue and Senator Enzi are trying to do. Um, I, we have to, in essence, get a process in place that actually works. It's impossible for the process that we have today to work. Today's, today's the perfect example of that, right? We pass a CR through December the 11th, and by the way, we make no policy changes. Now think about uh, an entity the size of our federal government. We spend $4 trillion of money each year of the American people's money, and yet we don't do the authorization process which lays out policies. If you can imagine IBM or Apple or Google or any company like that just continuing each year to do things exactly the same way and thinking that there's gonna be a different result that's not possible, but worse than that, in spending the $4 trillion that we spend each year, we only say budget over $1.2, $1.3 trillion. The rest of it is on autopilot. And it's the part that's on autopilot that is the greatest threat to our country's national security. So I actually think we need to do two things at once. One is we need to continue working through the processes that that Senator Perdue and Chairman Enzi are working on. It's gonna take a while to get that done. It's gonna cause a, we're gonna to have to have a total reordering of how we do business. That affects Senate careers and staffs, and we understand how difficult that is. We're dealing with human beings. We're dealing with people who have an investment in what they've been doing for years, and it's gonna take us a while to overcome the culture that's been established here. But simultaneously, as my good friend Senator Greg from New Hampshire has laid out, we also need to begin putting in place policy changes that begin saving our nation. One of the problems with the budget process, we pass a budget that makes assumptions, but those assumptions never become reality. And so we say the budget balances over 10 years, but we never do the tough things that it takes 
for those policies actually put in place. So a forcing mechanism, I know several thoughts have been put forth, to force us to do that, to force us to, to do that, to keep government open, to keep functioning, is something that has to occur. So I'm proud to be a part of this effort um, as a wingman. Um, I, I appreciate all the meetings that are taking place. I hope that we are going to get to a result. I agree with Senator Enzi. It would have been good to have done it when we didn't know who the president was going to be or who was going to be in the majority. That's not going to happen. But things like this that matter, that save our nation, take years to happen. And you're a young senator here by tenure. Um, these things take a long time. I look forward to working with you to ensure that we get the right outcome to save our nation and to keep us from this moral depravity that's taking place where in essence every day that goes by we're involved in generational theft where because we're not doing this, we're really laying a huge burden on future generations. So I yield the floor and thank you for your effort. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Senator Corker. Uh, moral depravity is so prevalent here, and it, it's, no more, it, it's, it's no more present and no more important than in the area of funding our military. I noticed Senator Ernst from Iowa is here. I appreciate her leadership as a fellow freshman in the Senate. And let me just highlight one thing very quickly. You know, Senator Corker just mentioned that about a third, 30% of what we spend is 35% over the last eight years is borrowed, and, and projected over the next 10 years, about 35% will be borrowed. And about 30% of what we spend is discretionary. That means that every discretionary dollar we spend as a federal government is borrowed. Let me say that again. Every dollar that we spend in our discretionary budget is borrowed. That means that our military, our veterans administration, our military construction, uh, our, our domestic programs, all of the things we're talking about are borrowed. And that means that we've got to get serious. We're, we have disinvested in our military because of this budget crisis. And it's another reason to get at the, the budget process. So, uh, Senator Ernst, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you being here. I look forward to your comments. Wonderful. I'd, I'd like to thank you, um, my colleague from Georgia, for spearheading this very, very important effort. We've heard discussions about uh, getting back to regular order. We've heard discussions about the difference between the debt and the deficit, and how, where do we go as America? So I am glad that, that you were taking the time, investing your time in this effort, and, and we look forward to walking through that process. Uh, but it's good to see so many of us here today engaged and uh, very active in this, in this effort. So I'd like to thank all of my colleagues today. I know a number have already spoken. Uh, but truly, our, our nation faces some very serious challenges and challenging budgetary times, all of that coming at us in the future. If we aren't honest about where we are right now and where we are headed in the future and fix it, our children and grandchildren are going to be handed a very heavy burden. We are already over $19.5 trillion in debt and a level that is growing rapidly every single day. And I'm from Iowa and back home in Iowa, we generally don't talk about things in trillions of dollars or even in billions of dollars. So when you break it down, that debt load represents about $60,000 per person in this great country. And that's quite a number and one that all of us should be concerned about. The American people are concerned and they are frustrated with Washington for a reason. Washington doesn't seem to be serious about stopping the reckless spending habits this town has. And that's why I think this proposal is a very interesting one and one that could provide opportunity as we move into the future. And so as we stop and look about the, the reckless spending habits, and most Americans agree that, that we have reckless spending habits here in Washington, D.C., well, I tend to agree with those Americans. I agree. Since coming to the Senate last year, I've worked to cut down wasteful and duplicative spending. And let me give you just one example of taxpayer money that has been wasted. 
Earlier this year, I introduced a bill that would limit the perks that wealthy former presidents receive. In 2015, taxpayers spent, taxpayers spent $2.4 million on travel, office space, communications, personnel, and other expenses for past presidents. I might add wealthy past presidents. At a time when they receive well-compensated book deals, speaking engagements, all kinds of activities, hardworking Americans shouldn't foot those bills. And they shouldn't be expected to. So, Mr. President, uh, we passed that bill in the Senate and in the House, bipartisan work on that effort. But unfortunately, President Obama decided to veto it. And while we are still working on a path forward, it leaves me just as frustrated as all of the other Iowans who know we can't continue spending money we don't have on things that aren't necessary. Washington can't even do the basic business of balancing our own budget. Plain and simple, we should. Families in Iowa do it every day, and they expect us here in Washington, D.C., to do the same. After all, it is their tax dollars that are being spent, and it deserves to be spent wisely. Unfortunately, it might just take a complete overhaul of Washington's ways to help us solve this problem. And again, I want to thank my colleagues for joining us in this effort. And while some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have certainly made it very difficult, if not impossible, to conduct business in any sort of regular manner, the reality is excess spending in this town seems too often to be bipartisan. And I know my colleague from Georgia mentioned earlier that our debt has ballooned under both Republican and Democratic administrations. We are far too often unable to take a good hard look at the money that's being spent because we often will get a 1,900-page bill at the last minute and we're given the options of either taking it or leaving it. And normally that's for funding most of our government. And that kind of practice doesn't uh, really show us a good way forward. It really forces us to make difficult choices about how we are spending our taxpayers' money, and it certainly doesn't give us opportunity to cut wasteful spending. We really have to do better by our taxpayers. And so I'd like to thank my friend from Georgia and my other colleagues that are joining us here today to help us in a way that we start thinking about uh, how we solve this crisis and do it in a creative way. So I want to, to again thank you, uh, Senator, for leading this effort, being at the tip of the spear, and uh, hopefully we are moving towards a smarter way of doing business in Washington. If we don't do better, I'm afraid the future of this great country will be a lot dimmer. So thank you, Senator. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Senator Ernst. I, I really enjoy your uh, leadership here in the Senate. And with that, I, I'm going to move to, I noticed that uh, Senator Rounds from South Dakota, who was a governor, who dealt with uh, this budget issue as an executive of a, a legislative body in South Dakota. I'm looking forward to your comments, Senator Rounds. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Senator. And first of all, I'd like to just start by thanking my colleagues that are here with us today, particularly Chairman Enzi, who leads the Budget Committee, as well as you, Senator Perdue, for the, uh, not only are you the only freshman that serves on the Budget Committee, but for leading us on this floor in this discussion of this very important topic of our broken federal budget system. Once again today, uh, Congress has just met our deadline to fund the government past the end of the fiscal year. While many of us here in the chamber, as well as the American people, are rightly frustrated by this, this requirement for a last minute reprieve, it is a reminder of our broken federal budget process and why we can no longer afford to continue down this dangerous path. I spent a great deal of time holding constituent meetings across South Dakota during August, 
meeting with folks from all over the state. During that time, our soaring national debt and runaway spending continued to be a concern to many. What I relayed to them about our country's fiscal future, what I will relay to you now is it's just not very pretty. Uh, I shared with them a report from the Congressional Budget Office, which in January of this year released an in-depth analysis of our debt and our deficit. That found that by 2026, annual deficits will double as a share of GDP to 4.9% and more than triple in dollar terms to $1.37 trillion or $1,370 billion, as the chairman of the Budget Committee likes to put it. It is also found that in 2026, which is just 10 short years from now, 99% of revenue that comes into the federal government, income taxes, both personal and corporate, all the gas taxes, all the fees, 99% of it will go back out in mandatory payments and then in net interest spending leaving no room to pay for roads or bridges, health care, our armed forces, and other vital needs within our nation. That 99% number, as they projected in 10 years, is a crisis. I would suggest to my colleagues that that crisis is not in 10 years, that crisis is now. Earlier, you heard uh, uh, Senator Corker explain very, very eloquently, I believe, the fact that it takes time to move things here. I would suggest that time is of the essence and we no longer have a 10-year cycle in which to make these changes. We have to begin the process of fixing this broken system and we need to begin now. Uh, in 2026, our country turns 250 years old. Wouldn't it be a marvelous goal if by that time we not only had this process fixed, but it was actually working once again? The report concluded, uh, this is the CBO report, concluded that the driver for this rising debt is largely from growing mandatory payments, as you've heard my colleagues say. That's Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, as well as interest on our debt. Yet here in the Senate, when we work through the appropriations process to determine the best way to spend America's hard-earned money, well, we don't even vote on mandatory payments, which are mandatory payments on mandatory programs. Today, those mandatory payments account for nearly three-quarters of all of the federal spending. That means that the continuing resolution that we just did is based upon about 28% of the total amount that we'll spend next year. It's simply not acceptable that we continue to look at and try to balance a $500 plus billion dollar a year deficit every single year, and we only look at 28% of the total spending that goes on. Let me just suggest this, that, that in order to fix this, as my colleagues have said today, we have to begin a process with expectations that the process actually works once again, and that there are timelines established well in advance of the end of the fiscal year. But even more than that, any process that we use in the future also has to bring in accountability, authorization, and appropriation together. Why is it that when we talk about Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, well, we just don't talk about it? There is no place in which we can actually sit down in a committee who is assigned specifically for Social Security, or a committee assigned specifically for Medicare, or one for Medicaid. Why is it that in states like South Dakota, where we have a South Dakota retirement system, retirement system which is one of the best funded and West best run in the entire United States, and it's been there since the 1970s, gets looked at every single year. And yet Social Security, which is such a huge and important part of a lot of people's lives in the United States, we're afraid to touch. It's not a matter of cutting, it's a matter of managing and making it more efficient and delivering the services and actually keeping it up to date. Revenues and expenses so that the people a generation from now can count on it being there. It's irresponsible for us to sit back here and to say that we're going to balance our budgets this year or make a commitment without looking at all of the programs that are out there because we simply can't balance a budget and we can't take care of those programs, Social Security, Medicare or Medicaid, unless we actively participate in managing them and in making good decisions and in getting the buy-in from the public that what we're trying to do is to make it better for them long term and then we have their best interests, best interests at heart. With that, I just want to take the time to say thank you. I think this is a critically important thing for all of us. Last year, we did a, 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 an omnibus bill at the end of the year, 
And a group of us got together and said no more. In fact, in our freshman bear den, as we call it, we said, it's time that we have a meeting with our leadership. I cannot tell you how pleased I was with the reception that we received by our leadership. We said, look, we agree. If you guys can put together and work this through, and Senator Perdue, I give you huge accolades for actually working through the hard work to get this done. This is important to our country, and this is one way in which we can begin to build credibility once again with the citizens of our nation. I thank you for the work that you're doing, and I most certainly look forward to working with our colleagues to fix a broken budget system, not only in the Senate, but in Congress, and get on with actually sending back to the American people on a regular basis a budget that they believe in and that they can count on. And with that, I would yield, sir, thank back. You. Senator Rounds, thank you for your comments. It, I really appreciate your leadership as an ex-governor here in this body, and particularly on this topic. And now I note that uh, Senator Sullivan from Alaska is here. He's been very outspoken about this since he uh, got here last year with us. Another member freshman, Senator Rounds. I, I'm uh, Senator Sullivan. I look forward to your comments. Thank you. Well, thank you, Senator Purdue, and thank you for uh, your leadership on this uh, important colloquy. You know. As some of us, uh, you've seen down here, Senator Rounds has mentioned it, there's a lot of members of the Senate who are very concerned about it, but what you're seeing here is a lot of the new members, a lot of the freshmen. There's 12 new Republican freshmen. Mr. President, good to see you. You're one of them. And we're very concerned about this. And we were concerned because a lot of us ran for office, a lot of us for the first time, because we saw what was going on with this budget process. We saw that... With all, due respect, with all due respect to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I mean, they didn't even attempt to even pass a budget for a number of years. Didn't even try. Think about that. You're back home, a state government, like Senator Rounds was talking about, or a household or a business, you're not even going to try to pass a budget? That's what was going on in the U.S. Senate. Remarkable. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to fix that. The first thing we did, and Senator Inzi was on the floor a little bit ago, but we came here and we passed a budget. Hadn't happened in years. We passed a budget resolution. That was an important start. And then we started to pass appropriations bills. As a matter of fact, this year, to the majority leader's credit, we started working on appropriations bills at an earlier time than any time in decades. And we got 12 appropriations bills passed out of the Appropriations Committee. And then what happened? We tried to start bringing them to the floor to vote on them, to move them. And the vast majority of those bills, all of which were very bipartisan, were filibustered by the minority leader of the U.S. Senate. Now, again, I'm new here. I still don't understand why they did that. A lot of us who came down on the floor were really upset when the minority leader of the U.S. Senate filibustered the defense appropriations bill, the bill that funds our troops, six times in the last year and a half. Six times. A disgrace, in my view. So what are we, what are we doing now here? More delay. More delay. We just got through a continuing resolution, which is not how to run the government. And they were looking at opportunities for more delay. For example, at the very end of this discussion, there was the idea of maybe adding additional funds for Flint, Michigan. Well, Mr. President, nobody cares about clean water as much as I do. My state has huge challenges with communities that not just have aging infrastructure like Flint, Michigan, but no infrastructure. I have over 30 communities in the great state of Alaska that don't have clean water and Sewer, don't have flush toilets. Americans, if you can believe that. So I certainly wanted to focus on that. But that's what we did in the regular order through the EPW committee with the Word of Bill. Where Flint, Michigan, and the state of Alaska and other communities that have challenges with clean water, we're going to address those through the regular order. And that's what Senator Perdue is leading on right now in the Senate. Through the regular order, getting back to a budget process that can handle the enormous challenges that you've heard about on the floor here. $20 trillion in debt, an exploding deficit. That's what we need to do. And I really want to commend 
Senator Perdue for his leadership. You know, what he did is something that takes a lot of courage here. A whiteboard approach. We just need to look at everything anew. With his leadership, his experience, a number of us, led by Senator Perdue, have been working on this for months. For months. And this is what we need to do to finally get a hold of these enormous budget challenges. I want to encourage all my colleagues, Republicans and Democrats, to join in this process to bring your ideas to fix what is clearly, clearly a broken process that is not helping our nation, that is driving up the deficit, that is saddling the next generation with trillions of dollars of debt. And uh, we have the beginning of a way to start fixing this. And again, I want to thank Senator Perdue, Senator Daines, for their hard work on this. And I, I'm certainly uh, going to be part of their important efforts as we look to put our country on a fiscal path of sustainable economic growth and budgets, which we're not on right now. Senator Sullivan, you're a warrior. I'm glad to be here with you. Uh, you know, it gives me hope that we're going to persevere and get this done. Thank you for being here. And now to help us close this out, um, my good friend from Montana, Senator Steve Daines, who has real world experience, both as a consultant, but also running and starting and running a high tech company. He understands what profit is about. But he, more importantly, he understands what meeting needs about. And I'm so glad that he can help us uh, close this out. I'll have a few remaining comments when he finishes. But Senator Daines, thank you so much for being here. Well, Senator Perdue, thank you for your leadership. And uh, what an honor to be down here in the Senate floor surrounded by freshmen, the, the freshman Republican class. We have the presiding officer, freshman Cory Gard from Colorado, Lieutenant Colonel Dan Sullivan, United States Marines from Alaska. David Perdue, who is also a CEO of a company uh, before he came to the United States Senate. We had Lieutenant Colonel Ernst from Iowa, Joni Ernst, proudly serving with Joni here, and thank for her service to our country, both in the military and now here in the U.S. Senate. And others, we had Mike Rounds, a governor from South Dakota, formerly, who had to balance his budget there or he'd lose his job. And as Senator Perdue mentioned, when I first came to Washington, I did come equipped with a skill that was familiar to Montanans like hunting and fishing are, and that was how to balance a budget. Because before I came here, I spent 28 years in the private sector, 13 years with Procter & Gamble. Then I spent 12 years with a startup company. In between that, three years in our family construction business. I know what it takes to make a payroll. I know what it takes to make a family household budget work. And yet balancing the budget is a skill this body has not embraced for nearly 20 years. As Senator Perdue has mentioned, four times out of 42 years has this process worked. That is broken. In fact, think about this, it's September 28th. On Saturday, it's October 1st, the beginning of the next fiscal year of the United States federal government, which will spend about $4 trillion this next fiscal year. We begin the next fiscal year in two days without a budget. Now, we were all here last year at this same point in time, the last week of the fiscal year, the last week of September, and we moved into this fiscal year, what? Without a budget. And there's no wonder that we're $20 trillion in debt when you don't have a budget. There's an old saying in business, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it. We do not have a budget here, and what has that created? $20 trillion of debt. In fact, when the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, issued its August 2016 report last month, it shared that this year's projected budget deficit now has increased from an already staggering $439 billion in its January report. They've raised it now to $590 billion, an increase of 34%. I can tell you this, if I was running a business, I could not get away with this. In fact, I would be out of business. In fact, serving on a board of a publicly traded company, we'd be firing the CEO, we'd be firing the board with, you, with results like this. And here's something to think about. Deficit spending is nothing short of age discrimination because this excessive spending is at the cost of our children and our grandchildren, and that's what we are passing down. We're racking up the credit card debt, figuratively speaking, and passing it on to our kids. And the American people are asking themselves, why aren't the people they've elected able to ensure the future for our children? How can balancing a budget be so difficult? Being here for two years in the Senate, I've come to realize the biggest hurdle to balancing the budget 
are the very rules, the very process that guides this institution. They're broken. Unless we fix the process, the leadership of Senator Perdue, who's getting out in front of this issue, unless we fix that, we will continue to repeat the growing deficits because this process is yielding the results it was designed to deliver. It's unacceptable. It must change. The CBO told us that the, this budget system we've inherited that was adopted back in 1974, the national debt then was $484 billion. We're now approaching $20 trillion, which is 105% of GDP. The first bill I introduced when I came to Congress, in fact, I walked down to the, the chamber here, laid the bill on the desk of the clerk. It was called the Balanced Budget Accountability Act. It says simply this, if members don't balance the budget, they shouldn't get paid. Let's bring some real world accountability to this institution. Let's put the pain on the members of Congress instead of the American people. I thought perhaps if our pay was on the line, it would, it would force us to be held accountable to not only balance the budget, but get on track long term with responsible spending. If we do nothing, if we do nothing, we know what will happen. We'll be right back here. Mark it on your calendars. Come back to this body. The last week of September, we'll be here debating a CR, pushing it into December with some big omnibus vote. It will happen again, guaranteed, unless we change this process and change the people that serve in this institution. We need action. We need accountability. We need it now. In conclusion, I will say this. I have one distinction, perhaps, and that's I'm the only chemical engineer that serves in either the United States House or the United States Senate. When you're trained as an engineer, you're trained to take a look at a problem and identify a solution. We have a solution with Senator Purdue's leadership. You see the freshman members of the Republican class of 2014. We came here not to accept the status quo, but to reject it and to change this way this country operates, truly to save the future of our kids and our grandkids. So I look forward to working with my colleagues to reform the budget process. Let's get this country back on the right track. Senator Perdue, it's an honor to serve with you. And thanks for getting in front of this very well, important issue. Thank you, Senator Daines. Uh, your leadership means the world here. And with that, uh, I have hope that we're going to get here. Mr. President, in light of the time and the hour and the other business that uh, is before this Senate body tonight, I will abridge my closing comments. But I just want to say this. There's a four-letter word that's missing in Washington today. H-O-P-E. People sent this class, 12 members of the Republican caucus. That's almost 25% of our caucus, our freshmen this year. We ran on this topic, as you heard several members say, but we had the leader of the, the chairman of the budget committee here. We had the chairman of foreign relations. These people are very concerned about this topic. But we're not just complaining about the status quo. And again, we're not complaining about the other side. There are no innocent parties when it comes to this debt crisis. You know, if you look at the last 75, 80 years, this country has lived and benefited from the greatest economic boom in the history of mankind. And yet here we are today, $20 trillion of debt, over $100 trillion of future commitments already made by this federal government. It's basically $1 million for every family in America. Mr. President, we don't need to talk about the need anymore. What we need to talk about is what do we do? That's what we came up here for. We need to focus on results. And this is what, I'm, what we're proposing. And, and then this is, we put it in language now. We're moving to put it into a bill on the floor. We have de Democrat input. And again, let me say this. The goal here is not to solve the debt crisis. That's the need. The, the goal in this process is to create a politically neutral platform where both sides, whether they're in the majority or the minority, can make their points during a budget process, move to an appropriation process, and get the government funded every year without all this drama. That's what the people of America want. It will protect our military. It will protect our national security. It will let us take care of the domestic needs we need. It will let us invest in our infrastructure to get this economy going again. But without this exercise, we will not start down the path that may take 30 or 40 years to bring this debt under control. It's that large. And let me emphasize one more thing. If this debt is not addressed soon, the rising interest rates that we all know are coming, we are living in a false world today of zero interest rates. If we just get back to our 30-year average of about 5%, we'll be paying a trillion dollars in interest. Mr. President, that's not possible. It simply is not workable. And all things come into the conversation. So this is what's going to happen. We're going to start debating this on the floor, hopefully soon. It may run into next year. It may go the following year. 
My commitment to my people back home is that we're not going to give up on this fight until we get something done about this. We proposed basically a couple of things. Three guiding principles were developed by a small group of people, and it's been welcomed by a growing number of people in this body. Number one, the budget needs to be a law. Number two, everything we spend, all $4 trillion of it, need to go into the budget. They need to be debated and covered in the budget by both sides. And third, if we don't fund the government by the end of the fiscal year, there have to be serious consequences. You heard one proposal tonight by Senator Lankford. There may be others, but we are going to put on the Senate and the House, for that matter, real consequences if we don't get the federal government done. Again, this is an exercise that we hope will be bipartisan. We want no advantage in this. We want a process that doesn't advantage either party. It gives both equal standing in the budget process, leading to a reasonable and effective funding of the federal government. Politically neutral platform, that's our goal. Mr. President, I will close with this. If not now, when? If not who? If not us, who? And I thank the, the forbearance of the, the president tonight. Thank you for allowing us to do this, and I will 